Hello, uh, and welcome to tonight's Age of Quarantine. I'm Caroline. I do marketing social media stuff for Vitus, and I'm really excited because uh, our guest tonight is Tamara Santibanez. Um, they are, well, you probably know them either through their tattoo work or their artwork, or because Tamara did one of our limited collabs for the month. So, you know, we're excited to get to talk to Tamara. I'm excited to get to talk to Tamara, partly because they're an awesome artist and tattooer, but also, um, you know, we, we obviously really love Tamara's work because we were so excited to collab with her or with them and put it on a, um, on a t-shirt and on a hoodie and on a long sleeve and stuff like that. So obligatory push for how awesome that stuff looks. Um, we're really excited that they were willing to work with us and yeah, uh, I am going to see if I can get Tamara to join and we'll see how this goes. Um, let me find how this looks. Cool. All right. For, oh, awesome. Perfect. So, uh, it always takes a second to connect, but hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you so much for making the time for us. Yeah, of course. I'm so happy to. Oh, sorry. I need some water. No, you're good. Um, so I know uh, the amount of like cool stuff that you have worked on could probably fill like multiple podcast lengths. So um, I'll try and keep it to, you know, just a little bit more informal uh, kind of stuff. But I'd love if you could kind of start out just by talking um, a little bit about yourself your sort of your background and kind of um how how you got into like using the style that you use which is this sort of um informed by this chicanx like tattooing black and gray style so yeah definitely um so i've been tattooing now for about 12 years um which is crazy to say i don't know <laughs> where that time went um it's been a trip to look back this year and realize it's been so long um and yeah I started tattooing on my own um like kind of self-taught like DIY like punk yeah. style homemade tattooing um before getting into a shop I worked at Three Kings um on Manhattan Ave and was there for about four years you know doing lots of walk-ins doing all kinds of tattooing but that was really when I first started seeing fine line black and gray tattooing and it really resonated with me because historically it's um yeah, it's a, a Mexican-American, Chicanx, uh, West Coast-based uh, tattoo style. Um, and so that really resonated with me because of my Chicanx identity. And um, I really started to dive into that. I was also, you know, really into punk and metal. So I love black and gray, all things dark. Um, yeah. And and that was something that I really wanted to do um, to do in, in that style, you know, was bring what I knew into it and bring, like, my love of New York, my love of, like, things that were goth and, and darker and combine them and try to make something that was a little more my own. Yeah. And I love one of the things that um, you've sort of talked about in some other interviews is the way that you have kind of taken this style and really injected some of your own sort of spin on it. I know there's, um, you know, you've talked a little bit about sort of like the punk, the metal, like the leather kind of um, sort of attitudes. There's also this like, I don't know, sort of like contemporary update of it. So you can get really sort of see like your voice in this kind of established idiom. And I was wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about kind of how working in that idiom itself has informed some of your other work. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think when you're younger as an artist, I mean, I, I'm still consider myself a young artist, but there's a lot of pressure to develop your own style and your own your own voice and to be recognizable and i think in tattooing right now there's so much pressure to have an immediately recognizable sort of signature style to set you apart because there are so many people people in tattooing mm -hmm. um and so it's really uh useful you know if people can see something that you did and then peg it as being yours um but that's also a hard thing to do especially when you're when you're new and you're still learning the craft and you're still yeah. learning the technique um so I don't know that's something that i talk to younger tattooers about and it's my one piece of like unsolicited advice i guess is to not force the style because that's when things end up being corny like when i look at the things i was trying to try to have a unique style yeah. when i was a couple of years in, i feel like it looks so cheesy and it looks so forced and it wasn't until i um 
let go of that a little bit and really just tried to work on on developing my drawing and trying to work on developing the craft um you know your hand is going to come through no matter what and the style will always always be there i think um, yeah it'll always look like you did it in some way yeah and one of the things that i think is so interesting about sort of like the way that your tattoo work speaks with your artwork is that it's it's so clear that when you are making a choice to render something like you've made that deliberate choice um like in that style because you are also capable of this like highly photorealistic like painting and drawing and stuff like that um and so i was wondering i know you sort of talked a little bit about like developing kind of an early tattoo style but i was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about also like some of the like earlier art influences on kind of just like things that you liked things that got you really st uh, psyched um like music art otherwise yeah well wow. it's i mean it's interesting to look back on because i have a background in printmaking you know that's what i went to school for and so for me tattooing um felt really similar to printmaking uh just like the way that your hand moves and like the tools and the like techniques that you have to apply felt really similar to that and now more recently that i've been doing leather tooling that also feels really similar to tattooing and to printmaking but when i was first getting into printmaking and really was focusing on that i was super into like gig posters like the whole gig poster scene um anyone who's doing artwork for metal bands like uh yeah. like john baisley from baroness you know like that kind of style like pushead influenced um art and like mike skinner you know um things that were a little more like visually frenetic and like hyper and hyper like, detailed really textural yeah i mean the texture has always been something that's really drawn drawn me in um and so I, I definitely worked in a style that was a lot more like that when i was doing show posters um and like more illustrations for bands um with tattooing you really have to like clean it up a lot <laughs> you know so i think if anything tattooing taught me to simplify and to refine things um, and to like trim away what was unnecessary to get a more timeless image and to think about how things would, would age. Um, I mean, when I think about, I guess with contemporary artists now, there are so many that, that I look to. There's so many painters who I'm really influenced by. Um, Jonathan Linden Chase is one of them. Um, Teresa Comati is another one of them. Uh, my friend Mario Ayala, who does really incredible airbrush painting is another one of them. Uh, my friend Doreen Garner, who is actually also a tattoo artist. I am like sort of obsessed with her work. It's so good. Yeah, I mean, Doreen does it all. She's a glass blower. She's an incredible sculptor um, and also an amazing tattoo artist. So um, yeah, I really love seeing how people take, I mean, you know, somebody like Mario, for example, takes airbrushing and like car detailing techniques and applies them to canvas. And um, I'm really interested in how people are using techniques that are maybe not considered to be so like fine art or maybe have been overlooked in that, that genre and making it yeah. their own. Well, and it's interesting also that you kind of mentioned that um, in partnership with like your printmaking background, um, especially because printmaking, like to your point, has this like gig poster history, but it also has this like more um, like activism kind of uh, like popular history as well. I know I don't know much about it. I know there's like a really rich, like specifically um, Mexican printmaking tradition around some of the more like revolutionary early century stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That was always something that really attracted me to about printmaking. I actually, I don't know if I can roll up my sleeve far enough to show you, but I have a tattoo of one of the first print printing pr uh, printing presses that says the tyrant's foe, the people's friend. Um, nice. That was something that I always loved about printmaking was this ability to like in a very homemade way or like very low tech way to be able to disseminate information rapidly and make multiples and like d democratize visual art but also the written word and information sharing um and you know make zines make posters make flyers leaflets um and yeah that's something that that printmaking has always held a special place in my heart about yeah um someone in the comments is uh voicing some appreciation for the nopales that you've done um, oh, and I was wondering cool. if you could talk a little bit about those because I've seen them come up like in your physical sculptural work, but also in some of your tattooing. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for me, that image is so emblematic of, or it relates so closely to my, my Mexican-American identity. Um, 
both as like a feature of landscape, as a, like a symbol of national pride, it's on the Mexican flag. Um, it's very woven into the mythology of Mexico as a country, um, but it's also a food, <laughs> you know, it's a really like specific food that if you aren't of the culture, you might be unfamiliar with. Um, and so there's a lot of familiarity and, um, and comfort in that image and for a lot of reasons. And I get to do that tattoo uh, a lot on people who are either Mexican or who are from the Southwest or from other regions that have that as a feature. Yeah, I, I, there's also, there was one installation, um, somebody else brought up your ceramics work, and there was one installation that I saw where you had the, the Nopales sculpture, but um, it was also surrounded by those sort of pyramid studs that you've made in that sort of like tile style. Um, I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about um, some of your ceramic work and kind of some of the disparate influences you've tied together. Yeah, so the ceramic work started, um, I consider myself to be very new to ceramic work still, um, because earlier I was doing the same pieces in polymer clay, and I've only more recently started to remake them in ceramic and experiment with that as like a more formal medium, but I really love doing it. It's really, really meditative, and over quarantine I was doing more and more of it, um, but yeah, I mean, ceramics in Mexico have a really rich history and tradition. There's um, a particular type of ceramic called Talavera pottery that's very visually recognizable and distinctive as being um, of like Mexican home spaces like or restaurant spaces. Um, a lot of it is used in like kitchen, bathroom decor. So these like very domestic spaces. Um, and so I really wanted to apply that type of visual theme to um, objects that might not be so, uh, so at home or like so um, safe or like easily found in like a traditional Mexican home. And so, uh, and so I think for me, you know, making these objects of like queer sexuality and like BDSM sexuality um, and thinking about like, you know, all of the queer Mexicans I know who have had to like come out multiple times, like they have to come out over and over to their family and like, or it's, um, you know, like kind of a open secret or they're not really able to have those conversations with, with family or in home spaces. Um, thinking about what it might look like to, to exist in a sort of like quiet and like integrated way when without yeah. conflict or like without, uh, without, yeah, I don't know, like a peaceful coexistence within the home, I guess. Um, and with the, that sculpture in particular that you mentioned, I made that over the quarantine because I, I was supposed to have a show that was going to open in May and it ended up getting pushed back until the fall. But then when I was sitting at home cooped up, I was really thinking about, um, traditional Mexican architecture and sort of like courtyard style homes where there's this mm -hmm. sense of, of like sort of a simultaneous like interior exterior um, where like the, there's central gardens, there's like these central spaces, they're very open to the outdoors and thinking about like just complicating the idea of yeah. um, like the, the barrier between the inside world and the outside world. Yeah, um, and if you are watching and you haven't seen any of those particular pieces, I definitely encourage you to go look at them. They're super cool. Um, especially there's like this like belt with some of like the, the, the O-rings, I guess, on them. Um, there's like a bullet belt. It's really cool. Um, but I was one of, the, one of the other things that I noticed you brought up in a couple of the interviews that I was um, checking out is you were talking about um, kind of the way that the artist exists almost as like a bridge builder. Um, and I thought that was a really nice way to put it, especially in light of what you were just saying about um, sort of using some of these like more familiar styles to maybe explore themes of like BDSM sexuality, queer sexuality, and like how that exists within the context of like maybe a more Mexican-American kind of identity. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk just kind of, I don't know, a little bit about um, some of the, the, the bridge building concept and like potentially how that connects to the way that you have these different disciplines that you work within and these sort of different um, like areas that your work lives in? Yeah, I think that that's something that I always struggle with is trying to integrate all of those and trying to find like a more, like more of a sense of ease of moving between those. Um, because I definitely feel very out of balance if I'm spending more time on one than on, on the others. Um, I mean, I, I really feel that it's an artist's like duty to be politically engaged and to be engaging an audience or viewers in conversations about larger issues than purely formal artistic elements. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think that art should 
open up those conversations and make the viewer ask questions rather than telling someone how to think or telling someone how to feel. Yeah. Um, and for that reason, I, I don't feel like I can create generalities or speak to like a universal concept of anything as a single person, you know, I have to, um, I can only speak to my own experience. I can speak to like connections that I can draw and themes that I'm seeing um, and questions that I'm asking. That's like a lot of what, you know, my work is, is questions that I'm asking or asking the yeah. viewer to share in, in an experience that I've had. Um, and yeah, and so when I say like bridge bridge building, I think that artists are often creative, um, creative problem solvers and can see connections and can see commonalities where other people might not um you know if, yeah I, it really is it really can be a different way of, of thinking or a different way of approaching problem solving and yeah um, and I think that that should be the prompt with any piece of art sure and I thought it was a, sort of an interesting way to phrase it especially given the fact that like I mean with your tattoo work but also with your ceramic work you are sort of using like an existing you're, or you're referencing sort of an existing set of aesthetics to kind of tell your own story and put your own spin on it. Um, and I know that's, um, especially with sort of the, the Chicanx uh, tattoo style, and you've talked a lot about this, um, the, the way that you really kind of delved into the history of it. Um, and that kind of triggered uh, some additional explorations about, you know, um, uh, liberation, the carceral system, things like that. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of just the way that some of your work has connected to these different areas, um, the politically active areas that you were sort of referencing earlier. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's definitely been a part of my, you know, my life even before it's been a part of my, my work, you know, part of what really attracted me to a place like New York moving here as a young person was how political political I perceived the punk and the music scene to, to be here. And I was moved here to New York and I was like, I can't wait to go to ABC No Rio and volunteer with Food Not Bombs and like yeah. volunteer at the anarcho feminist bookstore. And um and so that has, you know, so a lot of those concepts have just been things that I was so exposed to from a young age, you know, from being a teenager. And um and so it's always been in the background, um, but largely through um, but, but yeah, you know, I think when I started to work primarily in fine line, black and gray style, it just felt impossible to separate that from the origins of the tattoo style, which for people who don't know, um, that style really orig originated and has its roots in the California prison system, um, where people started tattooing with the things that they had available to them. Um, you know, the single needle style was originated and, um, there are some great documentaries and resources if people want to learn more about that. There's a good one called Tattoo Nation that I really like a lot. Um, but it, it felt really obvious to me that that style was pretty, uh, like pretty inextricable from the mass incarceration of black and brown people in, in America. Um, and thinking about the ways that that type of art was criminalized and that type of expression was criminalized and punished by the prison system. Um, it felt like it would be really irresponsible to, to continue in it even as a visual tradition without acknowledging that history and that those roots and without um, giving back to giving back in some way um and, yeah you know I identify as a prison abolitionist that's something I feel really passionate about and um I try to use that as a medium to raise awareness about what that means and what that can look like yeah and one of the things that I also um think is really interesting about some of the way that you fra framed this like tattoo tattoo culture as a whole is it does have this really close connection to like formerly like others and criminality and sort of like um, subcultures and stuff like that. And like, even if you think about the history of tattooing in New York, like it was not legal within New York City for like a really long time. Right. Uh, until like really weirdly recently. Um, yeah, 1996 or 1997. Yeah. So like within, within our lifetimes, like tattooing was legalized in New York City. Yeah. Which is bananas if you think about it and you think about like the culture that sort of exists around it. And I, I think a lot of the work that you have been doing to sort of raise awareness of just the origins of tattooing and stuff like that, um, I think is really compelling and interesting. And the way that you kind of um, have done some of this work like within the actual prison system itself um, and some, uh, your work as an educator, as well as like sort of um, someone who engages in activism. I know you, at one point I listened to an interview where you said you like didn't 
like self applying the term activist is like a little kind of weird to do. It's like calling yourself like defining yourself based on something that you really have to like do. Yeah, I think about that a lot. You know, I think especially now with the events of the last year, you know, I don't ever want to give anyone the impression that I don't want activists to be a term that sets someone apart from someone else, you know, because anyone has the potential to engage in activism. It's not an inherent quality that someone possesses over another person. You know, if I'm an activist, that doesn't mean that someone else can never do what I do. You know, I'm just a person who like happened to get an opportunity to like teach at Rikers Island. I happened to get an opportunity to do these things. Um, and it's really accessible and available to, to everyone, you know, um, you know, whatever type of change they want to be working towards. Um, so that's something that I feel feel strongly about is not defining activism as this like singular thing or singular type of practice that is outside of the realm of possibility for most of us. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry, I feel like I lost no, my you're good. thought and like I'm rambling it a, now. It was a very rambling question to begin with. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, like, I, as far as some some of the sort of um, consciousness as re with regards to like your your art practice and stuff like that, um, but also like your work as um, like I, I know you are also a writer, um, uh, and there you, I guess, could you describe your relationship to to discipline imp the imprint? Um, it's called Discipline Press. Yeah, so Discipline Press is an independent publishing imprint that I've been running sort of like off and on for the last several years. Um, it's definitely hasn't been very active in the last couple of years, um, but it is still an outlet and like an avenue that I use for, especially most recently, um, putting out some materials for education and tattooing around the idea of trauma-informed tattooing and like justice-centered tattooing. Um, so that's a little bit more the direction that it's taken and, uh, recently is like hosting discussion groups and teaching workshops. Um, but yeah, I've also published zines and, and books and art objects, um, which is something that I really enjoy doing. Yeah. And I, I know one of the other things that I think is sort of, um, interesting also about the way that kind of the tattoo community kind of intersects with the, the way that you've set up this pre press is that there is sort of this, like, networking like professional network kind of scene um i know you you currently are operating out of a private studio but you previously have operated out of these sort of like shared spaces um and i was wondering if you could just sort of talk a little bit more about um just kind of the relationships of like the tattoo scene to potentially some of the the art that you've been engaged in but also i know like even just like the music scene there's like a ton of overlap for all of these people i think it's really sort of fascinating yeah, yeah, there really is. I mean, that's something that I love about, you know, I've always tattooed in New York. And so now having tattooed in the same place, I mean, it's a, just like a, I don't know, like an ecosystem, I guess, that I knew so many people through like the music scene and the art scene um, that then became my tattoo clients. And then like, I still tattoo so many of those people 10 years later. And like, I've gotten to know so many other people who were clients of mine and like then became friends or like we connected creatively in other ways. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think when I first started tattooing, the, the biggest change that I've seen is that it used to be that you, it didn't really matter what you were like or who you were. I mean, there's a lot of like disclaimers to that statement, but, um, but it was kind of like, oh, it doesn't matter what, what you're like, it just matters what you tattoo like and your tattooing and like how you tattooed and what you tattooed was sort of like the focal, focal point. Um, and I really saw that with the advent of social media and Instagram that people were like, oh, if you're a really serious artist and you won't post anything about your life, you won't post selfies, like you'll only share your tattoos, you'll only share your paintings. Like that's what people are here for, this is work. Um, but the more I shared about myself, the more I felt that it brought more quality clients towards me. It's felt, it, it brought clients who saw my interests, who were like, hey, I saw that you like were playing a Dead Moon record. Like, would you want to tattoo the Dead Moon logo on me? Or like, just connecting over things that we shared that they might not have known about if I wasn't being a little more open about who I was yeah. and, my, and myself as like a full person and not just a tattooer. Um, and so that's something that I really love today is that my clientele are people who I learn so much from. I get to have incredible conversations with like, you know, I'll have a client who's like, oh, I'm a lawyer. I'm like, what kind of law do you practice? And they're like, oh, I sue states to maintain abortion rights. And I'm like, 
you go like thank okay. you for your service you know like please tell me all about that like i want to hear everything um or clients who are labor organizers or clients who i i don't know clients who are artists um so i don't know that's something that i've always been really grateful for in tattooing is this like you know deep connections that you get to have with people who you might not encounter in other parts of your life yeah and it's it's funny because i think like obviously some of the strength of the response to the work that you did for us is because the work is good but i think also some of it comes from the fact that you know when we say vitus x tamara santa Banez, like all of a sudden a bunch of people perk up because they're like oh shit like i like uh one of the guys from uniform was like i sold tamara their first like tattoo machine like that kind oh my of thing. god mike Berdan, i know exactly who you mean <laughs> yeah he did sell me my first tattoo machine and then i got to tattoo him years later and it was this beautiful full circle moment yeah but like i mean like uh you know i think with with um with three kings also like they're down the street from us like totally totally yeah um so i it's one of those things where it's like some total small world shit um with like, you know, punk and metal and stuff like that. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk, cause like, obviously you've also, you played in a band. Um, so I, somebody mentioned that they saw you uh, play in Zombie Dogs, so. Oh my God, uh, I played in one band, okay? <laughs> Just to set the record <laughs> straight. I'm not a musician like by any means, but that, that I feel like was a situation where the conditions were just perfect for me to like step in and do it. Um, because I had a bunch of friends who were already forming a band and they were like, hey, we need a singer. So I was able to just like come in and be a part of this thing that was already like 90% formed. Uh, but it was a really amazing experience. You know, I'm so glad that I that I did that. Um, I don't know if I could recreate those conditions or if it was something that I wanted to to like pursue further. But you know, getting to go on tour and like getting to play fests and getting to play a lot of local shows was amazing, especially at the time. I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm going to say you're probably selling yourself a little bit short here. Like, you, you were functionally in a band, and you did some <laughs> stuff. So, like, I think that kind of qualifies you as a musician. But, um, so I was just wondering, like, I know, um, just because you also, you come from Athens, well, sort of come from Athens, Georgia. So there was this whole, like, really intense, like, punk DIY, like, indie kind of career or not career, um, scene down there. And it, yeah. I know it really sort of informed a lot of like the direction that you ended up taking, not like the scene informed it, but like it really sort of enabled a lot of that. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about just like some of your earliest experiences with um, live music, with, uh, you know, you were talking a little bit about gig posters, stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was definitely the backdrop in, in Athens when I was young. I mean, I, it's not like I was going to REM shows or anything like that, but there was a ton of venues. There was a ton of record stores. There was like little vegetarian restaurants, you know, there was just like flyers everywhere all the time. Um, and I think I really took that for, for granted a little bit um, because, you know, it's a small college town. I think I was like, get me out of here. You know, you never like the place where you grew up. Um, but in retrospect, I feel really lucky to have been somewhere where I could go to all ages shows and I could, you know, um, be sort of involved in this local music and art scene. And I got to see really cool shows. Like I remember seeing like the Japanese hardcore band Hammer at like a, like a DIY space in Athens. You know, there was definitely really cool things happening. And then when I was 17, I moved to Savannah and Savannah had this like amazing metal scene at the time. You know, I got to see like Baroness, Pylesa, um, I feel like you like, municipal waste would come play there all the time. Um, yeah, lots of house shows, lots of like outdoor shows. Um, so yeah, definitely lucky from a young age to have gotten to be around a lot of that. And then I moved to New York and of course, like New York had so many amazing shows, all the shows. Everywhere all the time, yeah. Um, and I was wondering also if you could talk a little bit about sort of, uh, was it at the Museum of Art and Design where you had that installation? Um, that sort of sort of went back to that like teenage bedroom kind of vibe yeah that was actually at the spring break art okay. fair a few years ago um but yeah i made this installation the, the way the fair works is that they give you a, a room and you can kind of curate it you know differently depending on the proposal but um but yeah i remade like sort of a vision of what my teenage bedroom would have been like with you know like everything redrawn in ballpoint pens so, like the t-shirts the posters like all the patches, all the tape covers, the record covers were all um, drawn in ballpoint pen on white paper. 
Um, and yeah, so the idea was that it was like meant to be sort of like an archaeological site, like sort of a dreamscape, um, that there was enough like removed about the specifics of the individual that lives there that people could really situate their own experiences within um, like the artifacts that existed there, you know? Um, I didn't really get to be there a lot of the time that it was up, but you know, hearing people come in and be like, oh my God, like I had the same poster on my wall when I was a teenager, or like, oh my God, I still have this t-shirt. Um, and just hearing the ways that people would immediately relate their same experiences, just like, just from seeing a band logo or just from seeing like a record cover. Um, but, you know, also like thinking about whiteness in those spaces too, and like the whitewashing of a lot of punk, yeah. punk you know, history and like punk aesthetic. Um, and it's, <laughs> I'm just looking at the comments. It's really cool to see them popping up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was my first time really doing like a full room installation in that way too. So that was really fun to work on. Yeah, and it, um, I know you mentioned sort of the, the whitewashing of a lot of those spaces. And I know it, it's interesting to me because um, a lot of the spaces that you're currently working in, like in general, fine arts, tattooing, punk and metal are all like way behind the curve of like even everywhere else, frankly, in a lot of like um, representation ways. And I was wondering, um, with regards to some of like the especially like the chicanx like tattoo style um i know that the conversation is changing a little bit um i know you also mentioned some of like um during garner's work i know she does stuff with like ink the diaspora and stuff like that um but i was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about um sort of some of the changes that you might have seen a little bit recently but um also some of the um progress that obviously has yet to be made yeah I mean tattooing is definitely a really bizarre industry <laughs> um there's I feel like there's always there's a lot of like, conflict that is arising and there's a lot of things really being being brought to light right now which is is really important um and I don't know I try to be really mindful of of my like my positionality as somebody who's been in the industry for for 12 years because I think you know, even as much as I try to be mindful of this and, and like, I have a lot of unlearning to do myself, you know, like I was really socialized yeah. into this like traditional idea of how things should be done. Um, and I think I forget what is possible, <laughs> like what we should be looking towards, like what we should be asking for with, with change. And I, I think one of the biggest things that's been happening as far as shifts in the industry is that a lot of people are self-teaching and a lot of people are getting into it in these more independent ways and not going through a formal apprenticeship process, which has really expanded who is getting into tattooing. Um, so there's a ton more queer tattooers now. There's a ton more like trans, queer and trans tattooers. There's a ton more people of color getting into tattooing because they've been able to bypass that, you know, that pipeline of like, ship kind of model and yeah exactly where there was like a really limited number like a really limited amount of access um and a really limited scope of who that was being passed along to who that knowledge was being handed to um so that is really exciting um it's also exciting for me because like from a stylistic perspective because you have all these people who are like breaking all of the rules of style and technique and doing things that people would have said was impossible or you shouldn't or can't do. And yeah, I don't know. I think that that's how innovation in, in craft and in art happens is people who like really don't have a sense of the rules or don't even necessarily know that they're breaking them. Um, they're just doing what feels intuitive to them or doing like what, what they, whatever they want to try. So I'm excited to see how that shapes tattooing like from a, like an artistic and stylistic perspective. Um, but there is still so, so much work to be done when it comes to uh, like racial justice in, in tattooing. Yeah. Um, I mean, even a couple of days ago, there was a, ma a major outcry because a very popular machine builder made yeah. a joke about slavery on his, <laughs> on his profile and people seem to not think that it's a problem. Um, this is a person who makes a huge amount of money yeah. in the and is occupies a really prominent position um and some people feel that people like that are beyond critique which is certainly not true um i would really like to see uh black and indigenous and other people of color just have more ownership like have more ownership of their own spaces have their own machine building practices have their own businesses that they have um ownership and agency over and not have to be knocking on the door of 
these yeah like honestly frankly just racist people who are gatekeeping yeah and i think um you know obviously there's been a lot of that beyond tattooing as well like within fine arts within um like punk and metal and stuff like that and i think uh to your one of the things that i think is sort of interesting about like the practice that you sort of described is that a lot of it really does come out of like like the specific style that you're working in is this like chicanx tattoo style and like that does not come from like white people um and i think they're with some of like the history that people are starting to pay a little bit more attention to now especially also within like punk and metal and within art um the some of the erasure that had happened has sort of like been undone a little bit um not like fully undone but like people are starting to have conversations and understand like who has been historically missing from like the larger discussion of the discipline and then also like who has also like broken some ground um so as far as some of the like transformative justice stuff that i know you've also been talking about too there is also this idea that like you also have to understand like people's capacity for change as well um, in some of these like more regressive spaces. And I think the way that you've kind of talked about that is really interesting. And I was wondering if you could talk just like a little bit more about um, sort of your work with regards to kind of like transformative justice um, and sort of the attitudes that you, you've sort of described outside of just like the, the carceral system. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess for people who aren't who aren't familiar with the term transformative justice is a, like an abolitionist philosophy um, that uh, I'm trying to think of how to give like a really good one, like a good 101 um, that that basically uh, like aims to transform the conditions that cause harm to begin with. So whereas like restorative justice is about like restoring, restoring something when harm is done, you know, like if someone purse is stolen, like repaying the money that was stolen from them, for example. Um, transformative justice looks more critically at the pre preceding conditions and tries to transform those so that the conditions that created the like crime or the need to, you know, um, commit a property violation wouldn't have to happen. So the idea is that if people had access to things like shelter, mental health resources, addiction support, that they, that there would be far less crime and, um, and yeah, that we would not need prisons. <laughs> you know, abolition is a really long-term goal, but that's that's sort of the crux of transformative justice. Um, and so, when I think about things like racism, racism and tattooing, I think I think it's important to really look back at the conditions that are creating this to begin with. I mean, I think we have to just look at the the history of tattooing, um, and like you said, the erasure of of its origins as an indigenous practice. You know, if you yeah. think about uh, you know, even the origins of the word tattoo. Came tattoo, from yeah. Tattoo, and so in Samoa. Um, and so uh, just considering the fact that in, in the United States, when we think of traditional American tattooing, we think of, you know, Sailor Jerry, like type of flash, color, color American traditional tattooing, when there were many indigenous tattooing practices that were native to North America, or what we now know as, as North America and the United States. Um, that have been erased, that have been, um, you know, indigenous people were, were legally forbidden from practicing those traditions until I believe the 70s. Um, so when we think about something like, you know, caricature of indigenous people still being a popular motif in Tattoo Flash, like that's the whole history that that is sitting on the back of. Yeah. Um, so that is a conversation I would like to see happening more in tattooing as we try to make strides forward is grappling with the racist history and the colonialist history, you know, thinking about the popularization of, of tattooing and piercing through like the modern primitives movement, you know, that was through an entirely colonial lens. It was like, we think about somebody like Fakir Musafar, who was reading National Geographic magazines, and you have like National Geographic was incredibly racist in its yeah. coverage of indigenous body modification practices. So like, where did our perspectives originate from? Like, where what unconscious biases have we been absorbing from the very beginning um and how do we start to see things differently start to like retroactively correct that yeah um i think that's all like a, a really awesome way also the Ozfest would like to send a mask um, <laughs> but yeah no i think that the sort of the the conversations around like how to change those conditions and one of the things that i thought was really exciting that you sort of talked about earlier is like 
as now that we start to have all of these um, sort of more self-taught people at the table that are really sort of pushing the boundaries of what's possible, like the whole industry starts to get better and more interesting as a, a consequence. Um, yeah, yeah, I hope so. I, I hope it also, um, I don't know, I think, I hope that people stop accepting the, like, other people's ideas about what's good or like what's the best tattooing and start to expand yeah. their their notions of like what's what's good or what's acceptable or what's palatable yeah well and i think it's it's um one of the things that was really sort of exciting about um the the work that you do sort of like more from a um like a fine arts perspective is that you are also because you're integrating some of these like um sort of disparate influences that come from all of these different traditions um, you really do sort of start to like combine things in a new light um, that I think that sort of perspective helps, uh, I don't know, just sort of change a, a larger conversation. Because to, like to your point, you're talking about your own experiences, right? Um, and you're sort of talking about like bridge building through like explaining like how you've experienced something. Um, and I was wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about um, just in general, some of the artists that you see were, you know, they're doing really exciting things by sort of like talking about like their own experiences, their own art and, and, and sort of stuff like that. I don't know how I, how well phrased that was, but. In tattooing specifically? Um, specifically in tattooing, but if there's anybody else who like pops to mind, um, you know. Oh, I think my friend Stephanie is watching this live. Um, <laughs> hi. Um, yeah, I mean, there are so there are so many, I don't even know where to start. I feel like there is such an like amazing world starting to be birth of tattooers who are um, who just have this really like, empowering sense of tattooing as transformative and tattooing as a as a vehicle for um, individual empowerment and the sort of like, um, you know, I would want to like shout out like queer tattooing as a whole, you know, like I think that queer people and trans people understand like, uh, you know, like wanting to align your body with your sense of self like more than anyone else. And yeah, um, and tattooing is an incredible tool for that. Um, I mean, yeah, there's so, well, many, you know, so many people. Well, yeah, I know you've also you've people. also described some of the work that you do like um, tattooing as liberation work. Um, and I was wondering if you could expound upon that just a little bit, because it seems sort of relevant to what you just started talking about. Right. So that is the like the subtitle of a book that I finished writing, finished writing that it should be out, I think, in like a week. Um, we had some setbacks, but I think it's coming out uh, really soon now. So nice. but yeah, it's called, it's called Could This Be Magic? Tattooing as Liberation Work. Um, and essentially, the, the book is expanding on, it's using... Um, trauma, the idea of trauma-informed care as a as sort of a foundation and a starting point, but then really exploring what it is that um, tattooing achieves for people, you know, beyond art and aesthetics, um, and thinking about what fulfilling that, the toll, the toll that fulfilling that can take on us as artists emotionally and yeah. sort of like psychically, um, because I really do believe that all tattoo artists are doing, you know, emotional work around trauma whether they acknowledge yeah. that or not or whether they name it as that or recognize it as such I think that that is just an inherent part of, of tattooing as a profession and I think that that can lead to really high rates of burnout I think a lot of the burnout yeah. tattooers experience has to do with that rather than just pure overwork um and I also uh, and so, and so, yeah, that's sort of what the book is about, is about this, you know, this responsibility that we have and how we step into that in a way that's ethical and it's aligned with our value system. So mm -hmm. the idea of not just trauma-informed tattooing, but justice-centered tattooing. Sure. Um, and one of the other things that I thought um, sort of was interesting as you were kind of working through that is um, you really did touch on the way that tattoo artists, like, being a tattoo artist requires a lot of face time with other people necessarily. So there is this sort of like relationship and you, you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, I was wondering if you could just sort of talk a little bit about um, sort of the, the way that those interactions kind of inform the work a little bit, but also just like 
to your point about the burnout, it really does take a bit of an emotional toll as well, because you have to be sort of present. Yeah, um, there's a term that a therapist named Vicki Reynolds uses, which I really like that, which is community workers, you know, thinking about social workers and therapists as community workers, rather than being in this, you know, isolated in this profession. Um, and I think that that describes tattooers really well too, community workers, because we do occupy this like central role in, um, that's often like at the nucleus of a lot of overlapping communities, right? Like I know so many people in like the queer community, the punk community, like the rat, like the so like social work community. There's so many different, um, so many different, yeah, like social groups that we are a part of or that we bear witness to. And I think that that's a lot of the work of tattooing is like bearing witness and not just like facilitating the transformation, but also um, also being witness to it and holding space for it. And that can look like a lot of things, you know, I don't need my, all my clients to tell me every detail yeah. of what a tattoo, of how a tattoo is meaningful for them, for that to be the case. And for me to um, be able to honor that for them, you know, sometimes we can both be silent and we both know that that is what's happening. Um, a lot of times people do want to share about the meaning of their tattoo. You know, if it's a memorial tattoo for a loved one, maybe they want to tell you about that person and maybe it means a lot for them to, for you to be able to listen. Um, <clears throat> there's so many, there's so many examples of how that can happen in tattooing and what that can look like. Um, but it, it can be a lot to hold, you know, and I think that tattooers have a lot of different ways of coping with that. Yeah. It can be individual to each person. Yeah, and I know um, you've also done some work where um, I know you've sort of talked about uh, doing tattoo work for um, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women sometimes where it's like a tattoo cover up or it might be, you know, a tattoo cover up for someone who was formerly trafficked. And so, you know, there's that that's some heavy shit, um, not to like be glib about it, but um so I was wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit just about some of the work that you've done um, with people in the carceral system, um, you know, uh, not just like the tattoo work that you've done, but also some of the education work. Um, yeah. Sorry, can you say the last part one more? Yeah. <laughs> you just say the last part. Um, not just the, like the tattoo work that you've done with them, but also some more of the education work that you've done um with uh folks who are either currently or formerly incarcerated with like the drawing classes and, and stuff like that right yeah so um so yeah i have done some tattooing in that in that sense um working with people who have been recently incarcerated or formerly incarcerated i offer pro bono tattooing um for people who need cover-ups or reworks or coming out of the system um but I also have taught as a visual arts instructor at Rikers Island. I taught there for a couple of years doing drawing classes. And I've also taught at Bedford Hills um, Upstate, which is a women's facility, mm -hmm. teaching visual art, um, which was a really amazing experience. Um, I've curated some, some art projects with people who are on the inside. Um, I did a stationary set with each, each page being drawn by a different artist that was incarcerated at the time and, and bought artwork from all of them. Um, but yeah, I guess I, again, what, you know, what I was saying about, about bridge building, um, I think that a lot of people are less familiar with, with those worlds or like less familiar with those social issues, or maybe don't even necessarily have a loved one or a friend who has been incarcerated, um, or maybe haven't been incarcerated themselves. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a system that really tries to erase the humanity of the people who are, are trapped in it. Um, and that's something that I think is really crucial to, to affirm, you know, that there are so many hum human individuals um, who are really incredible people and have really full lives um, that are locked up that need to not be forgotten and not be erased because of that. Cool. Um, I am consulting my notes for two seconds, just because. Yes, yes, good thing. Um, I guess one of the other things, um, that I thought was kind of great, uh, at one point you were talking about sort of like what, what success looks like for artists. Um, and you know, by anyone's metric, like you are like a, a fairly, um, sort of like you've worked at a number of really high profile tattoo shops. You've done a lot of like really amazing work. Um, but you were also talking about sort of like 
mentally divesting from somebody else's idea of what success should look like. Um, I know like also within, you know, sort of the filter bubble that is social media, you were talking a little bit about that as well. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about um, some sort of recent kind of ways that like that has shaped the work that you've been doing. Um, especially like uh, under the circumstances of like the pandemic kind of shaping the way that everyone's kind of doing stuff. Yeah, I mean, I didn't expect to be working alone, you know, saved closed down because of the pandemic. And so sort of suddenly I found myself becoming a private studio artist in a way that I hadn't anticipated. Um, and that was a really interesting um, shift for me because I didn't really realize how much I relied on saved as like a shorthand for people to understand how like understand my tattoo practice you know people are familiar with the shop saved it has a really wonderful reputation um and so even if people didn't know me or my work if i said oh i work at saved they could kind of situate with me yeah. within the tattoo world um and uh and so that was an interesting change because i was felt felt really that i needed to like rely on my own reputation like stand on my own two feet like really trust my own process and how i like take care of clients and see clients and, and operate um but but yeah I think when I when I've talked about like my trying to divest from other people's ideas of success a lot of that has to do with like press you know I actually really don't love doing interviews like I've been actively declining them for the last year because I'm like I think yeah. there's other people, other people with more important things to say than I have to say right now and I think that um I don't know, like, you can look me up. There's interviews that I've done that are, like, yeah. still relevant. There's already a lot out there. I don't need to say it all over again um, just to, like, feel relevant or feel current. <laughs> like, it exists. I exist. Um, and, and something that I found, too, is that when I've been included in media that wasn't very personal, like, you know, like a, like a top 10 list or, like, some like a blurb, like something that yeah. was, like, a, a repost that really didn't illustrate, like, the scope of what it is that I do or how I approach things. Um, a lot of the clients that end up coming to me as a result, I end up declining or referring to other people because they seem really unfamiliar with how I work. Um, and a lot of them are asking for things that aren't even really in my wheelhouse or in my mm -hmm. style. So, um, so if somebody's coming to me because they saw me on like a best of list, but they haven't even familiarized themselves with what I do, then we likely might not work together very well. Um, yeah. Because the chances that I'm the right artist for them pretty low if they haven't taken yeah. the time to investigate that for themselves um but yeah a lot of that honestly just feels very arbitrary <laughs> you know it can feel very nepotistic and just like based on who you know and who's accessible to you and there's always some bias that's inherent in that too um I don't know I think it's easy to feel really overwhelmed with social media and these like very large conversations and discourses that are happening I was, I was just talking with some friends about this um a couple of days ago but I was like oh my god, I feel so overwhelmed by, like, the scope of racism and tattooing. <laughs> like, how is this ever going to be shifted or changed and undone? Uh, and then when I, like, don't look at my phone and I work with my clients in my own space, I'm like, oh, okay, this feels really grounding. This feels really centering to get, get to show up for one person and do the best job that I can do in the ways that I know how to do that, like, align with my sense of integrity. Um, I can't control the whole internet, but I can control this moment here and now. Uh, and that is something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm sure it's also like, I think it's especially difficult right now because the whole internet is sort of more how people are socializing just due to necessity. Um, and I think just, you know, with the last like, you know, year of everybody being stuck inside, um, you know, I think there's kind of a, an itch for change in general. Cause I think also like the, the circumstances of the pandemic have sort of laid bare a lot of the structural issues um, that potentially were not, you know, evident to everybody prior. So I think a lot of people are sort of showing up for a conversation that's been happening, potentially not including them just cause they weren't aware of it and not paying attention a lot of the time. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't I, I think, the, the sort of the, the concept of success as you were talking about it, I thought was sort of interesting though as well, because it, it really felt like you were kind of defining your own success beyond just like the interviews, um, but also sort of like what you wanted to do. And I was wondering with like your own practice now, um, sort of how that shapes the way that you've kind of approached having your own studio, which I know the circumstances probably weren't 
ideal, but you know, now you're sort of there. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about sort of how having your own studio has changed your practice a little bit. Yeah, it's definitely made me slow down a little bit. It's made me hyper aware of the amount of work that I'm doing. Um, I will confess, I'm definitely still trying to like find the best work life balance. I think the pandemic has made me have a lot less capacity than I, I would have beforehand. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, I, I feel really I feel really fortunate because tattooing is so inherently social. I mean, that's a, a risk that's also higher in it, you know, because we have to be in close contact with our, our clients. Um, and so as a result, I'm really not doing any socializing outside of tattooing because I want to keep my clients as safe as possible. But I also feel lucky that I get to socialize as part of my job um, and that it's people that I might not otherwise see. Um, I, I really like that it's, giving me this time and the space to just show up, like I said, for one person at a time without a lot of other energies in the room, <laughs> like having a little bit of quiet, it definitely feels yeah. like peaceful, like maybe like a little oasis moment, hopefully. Um, and that's something, I mean, even when there's just, so, there's just so much chaos and there's so much uncertainty happening. Um, and it does feel like part of my job is to give people a, like a little moment of respite. Um, I, I noticed bef before the pandemic, I had so many clients who would come in and they would be like, oh my God, this is the first time I've like sat down all day. <laughs> They'd be like, oh, this is the first time I've really not looked at my phone all week. Yeah. And it showed me how much people work and how much they um, expect of themselves that tattooing, and you know, and tattooing really can be a time that you're doing something for yourself. Um, if it's something that you've thought about for a long time too, a lot of people are coming in now who have thought about these big projects. I'm outlining a back piece like every other week. Yeah. Um, which is really cool. But, uh, you know, even during the election week, I was remembering the 2016 election. And all my clients that week were people of color who really needed to process like their anxieties and fears. And I held space for that and like had a lot of conversations with them. And so I was going into this election thinking like, okay, that might be part of my job this week, like I need to really feel prepared for that mentally. Um, but even, you know, through the whole week when there was no answers about what was going to be the outcome. Uh, nobody wanted to talk about it. People like really just needed to come in and have like two hours where they weren't talking about it. Um, and I was really happy to provide that too, you know? <laughs> so a lot of it is about trying to be responsive and perceptive about what people are really needing and hoping that I can show up for that or like seeing what I can do to, to provide it. Um, but I will say, I don't know, getting a, uh, you know, working alone is getting a little lonely. <laughs> I have a friend who's going to be coming to uh, to New York to work with me in June is going to be relocating. So that is something I'm really looking forward to is having at least another person like sharing the space with me. Nice. That's really exciting. Um, any other projects on the horizon that you think we should all be aware of? I know you mentioned your, uh, your book. Um, so we'll keep an eye out for that. You also have the workshop coming up on Friday, I think. Yes. So I am doing more of that, which is really exciting. Um, I just taught my first online workshop uh, a couple weeks ago, I guess. That feels like so long ago. But um, yeah, I have a couple more coming up. I'm teaching one on Friday on compassion fatigue and burnout prevention for tattooers. And then um, on March 12th, I'm teaching another one that's an intro to trauma-informed tattooing. And I'm going to be doing more dates of those coming up. So um, keep an eye out if you're interested in those. And um yeah, for right now, those are the two things that I'm focusing on. Cool. Um, well, we're sort of coming up on time. So I wanted to take a moment to thank you so much for for making time for us. Um, also for the kick ass design that you produced for us. It's like gorgeous. Dave can't stop talking about it. And it's like, kind of amazing. Um, oh, I'm so happy that you asked me. I mean, I have so many memories of Vitus and it's such an institution in the neighborhood. So I was really I was really happy. But yeah, and so I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, for everybody who's made it this far, um, obviously follow Tamara on Instagram. We'll post their uh, their Instagram handle. Definitely check out um, the website also, both the tattooing website and the art website. Um, and if you're curious about some of the tattooing resources that Tamara mentioned, I believe there's a pamphlet on the tattoo website. Cool, um, and probably more info. And I know also um, if you are looking to get tattooed, but maybe still not yet comfortable in sort of that one-on-one -on -one space, I know Tamara has gift certificates. So 
those are also an option. So yeah, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone that tuned in. And any last words? I don't think so. Yeah, thank you, everyone. It's really nice to see some familiar faces in the comments. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Cool. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll save this on the page. So if you missed part of it, you can always go back and tune in.